interested in taking a deep dive each week into a compliance or compliance-related topic? Then Compliance Into the Weeds is the podcast for you. Join Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, and Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, as they go into the weeds to flesh out a story which you can use to better inform your compliance program. Both you and your compliance program will be the better for listening to this podcast. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. In this episode, Matt and I take a deep dive into the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer Report. Matt wrote a great blog post on it entitled The Edelman Trust Report Gets Grim. We take a look at some of the raw numbers and then how the trust report has gone down in developed countries, the issues that uh, particularly are of concern to compliance practitioners, and really the growing divide between the uh, haves and have-nots around trust, trust for government, trust for businesses, and trust for the community as a whole. It's something that every compliance practitioner needs to be cognizant of, particularly when employees at companies not only uh, lose trust, but actually take action against companies that they think are moving against the public interest and cites certain examples of that. It's a fascinating uh, podcast on a subject that comes up annually from the Edelman Trust Report. Matt did a great uh, blog post writing it up. It's something that, uh, although the news is grim, I think it will help you as a compliance practitioner putting together your compliance program. One. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance and the compliance evangelist, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance for another episode. Today, we're going to take a look at the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer and a blog post that Matt put up last week entitled Edelman Trust Report Gets Grim. So, uh, Matt, first of all, thanks for uh, literally coming uh, out of the uh, ICU deathbed in Boston General to uh, do this podcast. Uh, Hi, Tom. So just so everybody knows, uh, here in Boston, the city is not actually having any of the Wuhan flu. But if you are listening in Boston, you probably know half the city is down with the flu these days. Um, My kindergarten, my son's kindergarten class had half of their students out last week with the flu. And uh, today, my wife told me that at the elementary school where she teaches, they had 50 students out with the flu. And it is not a very large school. And I myself have been fighting this flu while I've been thinking about a post on the coronavirus for sometime the next week or two, right now we still have the Boston virus kicking my behind. But, but I am here and ready to go on the Edelman Trust Report. So, Matt, the uh, report came out uh, last week. And what were some of the highlights or perhaps lowlights if we want to go in that direction? You know, yeah, that might be the better word. Um, we are. I'll start with. The, the trust report itself, for people who may not be familiar with it, this is well worth a ethics and compliance professional's time to read it. Uh, the Edelman Trust Report, or the, the Trust Barometer, has been an annual survey, now done for 20 years, uh, very comprehensive, 34,000 people uh, polled around the world in dozens of countries, where the Edelman people ask them, their trust in various types of organizations. How much do you trust your government, the media, NGOs, uh, business, and occasionally some other types of institutions? And the good news is that globally, all people, all together, all of us are marginally more trusting in institutions generally this year we've gone up from a rank of I think 53 on a scale of one to 100 two years ago, to 54 this year. Thus concludes the good news in the Edelman Trust Report, because the rest of it is very unsettling stuff. Um, That was for all population, all countries, and trust in all institutions worldwide. It is still in the positive territory, um, and it marginally ticked up a point. So here in the United States, for example, uh, trust the general population, trust in institutions here has fallen from 49, which means we have generally a distrusting people right now, fell from 49 to 47. That's over this course of just one year, uh, as did the United Kingdom, France, Australia, Canada, uh, I think several other Western governments as well. They have all seen their trust 
the general population in those countries' trust in institutions has fallen, sometimes significantly, uh, more than the two points that it fell for the United States. Um, so that's not necessarily good news. Uh, another bit of unsettling news, I think, the Edelman Trust Report splits that population of 34,000 respondents into two groups. There is a high information group of the top 20%. So these are people who are well-educated, uh, high income, and high consumers of news. That's in the top 20%. And then there is a mass population group, the other 80%. There is a big gap between the trust of these two groups. If you polled that high information group, how much trust did they put in institutions? They're very trusting because they seem to believe that institutions, companies, governments, like they generally know what is going on. They know what to believe and what not to believe. The bottom 80% are much less trusting of all sorts of information. So we've got an elite group and a mass population group who are moving in different directions, which strikes me as never a good thing. And it's not specific to any country. It's not specific to any institution. You want to know what is the trust gap in um, NGOs in pick a country, doesn't matter, or in business or in government or anybody else, doesn't matter. The high information people are more trusting and they are moving in that direction. The mass population is becoming less trusting. And anytime I see a big gap emerging like that, I personally feel uncomfortable. It has implications for politics. It has implications for business, for social policy, all sorts of stuff. Um, here's more disturbing news. Uh, income inequality now sours the public trust in institutions more than economic growth does. So that idea that a rising tide lifts all boats, if it's lifting the yachts far faster than we in the dinghies and the rowboats, even if we're still going up, that's going to undermine trust more than the state of the economy, um, which is frankly, I think, news that people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders would probably be secretly quite happy that that implication is out there. Um, but it's out there. And um, then, you know, as I dug this up, actually, if income inequality – is a growing driver of distrust, you might like to know that in the United States, we are at our highest level of income inequality in at least the last 50 years right now. So says the Census Department, which put out a report on that last September. I dug it up. And um, income inequality has increased markedly in this country since 2017 and the tax cuts that Republicans enacted in Congress. And um, so we have all of these big social shifts that are floating around. I'm not sure anybody knows their full implications, but none of them are necessarily like good things. And trust in large institutions, including large business, is really a vital ingredient if you are trying to get customers to buy your products, customers to trust your brand, employees to trust your CEO, employees to follow the policies that you're listening to. All of that, um, that is why the Edelman Trust Report is such a thought-provoking report in any year. And I think it's actually quite pro thought-provoking this year. But that, that's, that's the summary of it. So, Matt, what did uh, the Trust Report note about businesses and how individual uh, people feel about their, uh, their individual employer? Yeah, that, that is also interesting, and this is a trend that has been coming along for a while now, is that, okay, so nobody trusts anyone anywhere and anything except that your trust in your specific employer. Trust in business is generally not that good. It's middle of the road in the United States, and it can be up or down in other countries. But trust in your employer is still in the mid-70s, high 70s. I think it's 77 or 78 percent this year, um, which is very good. Uh, except that in addition to employees trusting their own company to do the right thing, uh, they do not necessarily trust businesses generally to do the right thing, only their own, but they are feeling that businesses need to step up and be more vocal about various social issues that governments seem unable to solve, such as climate change or um, pay inequity or how to take care of employees, workforce training, if we are all going to lose our jobs. 
um, from automation or something like that. So here's the statistic I'll throw at you. Uh, it is important that my employer's CEO speak out on these issues. 92% said yes. It is important that my CEO speak out on what issues? Okay. Uh, training jobs for the future, 84%. Uh, ethical use of technology, 81%. Income inequality, 78%. Climate change, 73%. Immigration, 62%. So there is a lot of trust employees are placing in their specific employer. Good. That's an opportunity for people, except that they are expecting their CEOs to step up and lead, not just have really cool compliance programs and policy management tools, but to take a stance on what could be some very div difficult, divisive ethical issues. And then the CEO is going to point the direction the company is going to follow. And I could see that also being a very polarizing thing that companies will have to deal with. Uh, but that's that's where we are. I think uh, you're absolutely spot on in terms of there are a lot of implications for the compliance practitioner uh, in communicating not only uh, – cultural issues, compliance issues, ethical issues. But the report shows, or at least your blog post highlighted some specific industries where uh, trust seems to be lacking for a variety of stakeholders. And I specifically point to the tech sector. What did you see in that area? Yeah, nobody trusts the tech sector. And uh, given some of the uh, ridiculous things that, frankly, we've seen from companies like Facebook – I can't say I blame them, um, where it was you know, basically sharing user data without their consent to uh, parties, possibly foreign governments, that were looking to sway the 2016 election. That certainly sets a sour taste in people's mouth. Just this week, yet again, I saw another statement that Facebook will not crack down on false or information in political ads and outright lies. Facebook believes it is not its place to do that? Well, a lot of people disagree. And so a lot of people do not trust Facebook to do the right thing. And uh, so if you are a ethics and compliance professional at any large tech company, could be Google, could be Amazon, could be Facebook, could be Apple, um, you're going to have an uphill battle, probably trying to convince all stakeholders generally that the company should be trusted. And I know that compliance officers are going to say, look, man, it's not my job to handle shareholders. It's not my job to handle necessarily the public. We worry about ethical conduct for employees. That's our priority. Compliance officers are right to say that. But here in the real world, there's a very blurry line between stakeholder groups. And I think social media has allowed different factions within separate stakeholder groups to find each other and start to form alliances and to try to hold companies accountable to their own ethical standards, not what the company wants. So you could be working with the Trump administration on, I don't know, immigrant detention at the southern border, and you're going to alienate customers, you're going to alienate uh, the public, you're going to alienate the employee base. Not all of those three groups, but you'll alienate some in each of those groups. And what's new is they will be able to much easy, more easily find each other and form a sort of a coalition to try and pressure the company. And look, it's going to be up to the CEO ultimately to decide what to do with that kind of a problem. But don't underestimate the severity of a problem that can be. It can be very disruptive to people. And I think a lot of compliance officers know that. Um, it is what it is, but yeah, I think that uh, the tech industry in particular has a lot of work it needs to do to be able to regain or gain for the first time uh, people's trust in what they're doing. At last summer, we saw the uh, Business Roundtable statement on the purpose of a corporation. Would you see that as an effort to, if not get ahead of some of the issues raised in the Edelman Trust Barometer, to begin to address those or have a framework to address those if they move forward uh, as they've said they would? Uh, you know, the, so the if they move forward is one big part there that gives me pause. Um, and I don't necessarily know if I would agree with them trying to get ahead or might I say trying to dodge the bullet um, of more aggressive um, assertion, more assertive stakeholders out there. Uh, if you read through the trust report, you can see that there really is a simmering resentment among a lot of people 
who um, I will put it this way there. Let me find some of the other statistics. Uh, 55% of Americans believe that they are at high risk of being left behind in the economy. And 57% fear that they will be worse off in 2025 than they are today. Uh, 55% fear they are, quote, losing respect and dignity that they once had. So there's a lot of tension there. There's a lot of resentment. And I'm pretty sure that if you took a right-wing Republican and a left-wing Democrat, they would probably both say, yeah, I feel like I'm at risk. But they feel very different types of risk, and they're going to be pointing fingers at each other. And the problem for companies is that you've got both types of people in your workforce, and they're pointing fingers at each other while they're on the job, or they're pointing fingers at your company on social media, and you're trying to figure out how do we placate multiple constituencies that have conflicting views about uh, the future of this country. And uh, generally, they all feel like this future of the country is going to be worse, um, but each one seems to think the other one is the one that's causing it to be worse. So I don't quite know if I answered your question or not there, Tom, but I mean, like it sticks in my mind that there's a lot of resentment that CEOs are aware of. I just, I don't know how seriously they're going to take it. I'll give one example of a very good concrete action that I saw it was a uh, facial recognition company down in Arizona last year. Unfortunately, the name escapes me right now, but they came out and said that they were not going to offer their product to law enforcement because they understood that the limits of their facial recognition and artificial intelligence products, uh, they, it, they weren't going to work very well. They would work very well for cops who were trying to arrest or identify white citizens, but the technology is not there yet to identify minority citizens. It's terrible to identify black or brown faces still relative to white faces. So this CEO stepped up and said, my technology is not ready for prime time, so I'm not going to sell it for that use anymore. Now, that was a small company, not publicly traded, but nonetheless, um, a very tangible step that you could say where you like, that's his ethics in action. And I think a lot of people would probably praise him for putting ethics ahead of profit. And I'm not necessarily sure people believe a lot of other companies would do that. Well, Matt, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time today, but this has just been a fascinating exploration of, um, I guess I'm going to conclude a very troubling report, but one that needs to be studied certainly by everyone in the compliance uh, profession to begin to formulate responses uh, so that we can have sort of adequate compliance and ethics and good cultural norms within an organization. Tom, can I tack on one other thought before we wrap up? You bet. So here was one headline from the report that ethics and compliance officers would want to think about. Uh, the headline was, trust is built on competence and ethics. Sounds good. Then they get into the data. Businesses are seen as competent by a majority of Americans, by a fair bit, but not ethical. Now, I think a lot of ethics and compliance officers would say that's not really fair. That's not really true. We feel like we are ethical. I think a lot of companies are quite competent, but they're going to need to demonstrate their commitment to ethics more in a more visual, more understandable, more gripping way to convince people because right now they do not buy that. And, and that's my closing thought. Well said. Well said. Well, Matt, I'll be interested to see what next week brings us. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. I will link to Matt's blog post in the show notes, and you should also take a look at the full Edelman Trust Report. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. I hope you'll join us again next week where Matt and I take up a topic into the weeds of compliance. Thanks so much for listening. We look forward to visiting with you again. Thank you.